Now there's a lot of things out there that can give temporary relief from sciatic nerve issues like piriformis syndrome and sciatica and other types of low back pain and also hip pain. But for the overwhelming majority of people, the results don't stick and a couple hours later or the next day they wake up and they're in the same spot with the same issues. The biggest issue I see is that people are stretching this area, but they're not teaching their body and educating it what to do with that space and how to hold on to that new space. Now the sciatic nerve runs through our vertebrae of our spine and then into our pelvis and passes through a lot of the tissues that are in the backside of our pelvis, specifically like the piriformis. Now there's a couple of things that happen here. Most commonly what I see is that people have a lot of extension of their low back. And this is something I talk about a lot in other videos, but not specifically as it relates to this, because there is a difference here in these cases where the nerve root gets compressed like this, but many cases, because there's so much extension of the low back present, people's center of mass is getting pushed forward more so onto their toes. And that's not really great for keeping our center of mass going down the midline of our body over our midfoot where it normally should be. So our body's going to seek a strategy to prevent us from falling so far forward. If we're constantly like that, that is going to disrupt our postural equilibrium. That's going to throw off our proprioception and our body's not really going to feel very safe. So what the body commonly does is it's going to compress the backside of the pelvis. It's going to squeeze we stuff down here specifically at the lower level of the pelvis and that is going to compress that area and that's going to put a lot of tension on the sciatic nerve once more. So now we have two areas of influence on that sciatic nerve and we have a lot of what we refer to as posterior lower compression of the pelvis. Now the issue is not necessarily that we're extended and the issue is not necessarily that we have posterior lower compression of the pelvis. The issue, the root cause is that our center of mass is being pushed forward onto our toes. So in order for us to resolve this issue, we need to learn how to get our center of mass to shift back and we need to learn how to stack our ribs over our pelvis and we need to learn how to do that without compressing this lower posterior area of our pelvis because many times when people go to do something like a posterior tilt of their pelvis they'll just squeeze their glutes and that is just going to further facilitate compression of this area so we don't want to do that we want to learn how to stack without squeezing stuff especially at that area so one of my first favorite exercises to do that would be this what we're gonna do is get our feet on the wall. And ideally for most people, they're gonna have a shelf underneath them of some sort. So you could use something like this DC block, you could use a bench, uh, you could use whatever you need to stack up as long as you can still maintain your whole foot flat on the wall. That's gonna be the important part there because we need foot contacts on the wall. Those foot contacts are the inner heel and the first metatarsal head on both sides evenly. That doesn't mean we lose the outside foot, that just means that's where our bias is. Now, we're also gonna have an object in between our knees. And this object needs to be a little bit compressible, so that way when we squeeze it, our knees very slightly move in. But we also don't want the object to be so large that in the starting position, our knees are outside of our hips. So they're wide like that. It should be, we're starting pretty in line with our feet and our hips. And now what we're gonna do keeping our hands on our low ribs and our chin directly at the ceiling. We're going to do a little posterior pelvic tilt. And we're gonna do that by dragging our feet down into that shelf or down on that wall, but they're not obviously going to move. It's the intention of dragging our heels down, which is going to lift our tailbone off of the floor. And as we do that, we're going to feel our hamstrings engage on both sides relatively evenly. Our low back remains flat. So that's all we're feeling right now is hamstrings. After you have that, you're going to squeeze the ball. And for this, you're gonna squeeze it a decent bit. On a scale of one to 10, you're looking at about somewhere between a five to seven out of 10. Not to the point where you're shaking or you're sweating, just enough to kind of feel your inner thigh muscles working on both sides. So make sure you don't lose your hamstrings when you get that squeeze. And then you're just going to inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, 
softly sigh all the air out. You're going to be very tempted to tense other things up in your body as you do this, such as your neck, such as your calves, such as your abs, but you wanna make sure that nothing is engaging other than your hamstrings and your inner thigh muscles. The only exception to that could be a little bit of your side abs at the end of the exhale. But as long as you're isolating those muscles, you're doing a really good job. The most common mistake on this is people are gonna lift their hips too high in the air, and that is not what we want. We want the tailbone to be slightly lifted off of the floor, but not the low back. So it's important that you just do a little bit of a tilt and then engage with the squeeze. Depending on you as an individual, you may want to add a little support underneath your neck, like a towel rolled up. Just make sure that it's only as thick to the point where you feel like your neck is supported and your chin is passively pointing straight up at the ceiling. You don't ever want to do this where it's so thick and it's tilted back or it's collapsing down. As a last resort, if you don't have a wall and a shelf you can put up against that wall, you could just put your feet on a bench or a chair, something stable, and drag down into that. It's not the most ideal thing ever, but it will certainly be better than nothing. Just make sure when you are doing this, it's just pretty much your heels digging down, maybe a little bit of your shank. You don't want the bench so close to where you're here. It's gonna make it harder for you to find your hamstrings and tuck genuinely. Now from there, we need to get a little bit more upright. And I like an exercise like this for that. We're gonna start with an object in between our knees that's a little bit compressible that allows our knees to stay in line with our toes. So it's not too large, shoving our knees out. It's not too small, making our knees collapse in. We're gonna place it in between the mid part of our thigh there. Now, we're gonna get one foot length away from the wall. So take one step, place your heel in line with your toes of that back leg, and now get a toe straight ahead hip width stance. Now we're gonna make sure that our head is stacked over our rib cage and our pelvis. So we want a lot of our back touching the wall with our head nice and relaxed, our gaze looking straight ahead. And then what we're going to do is feel the foot contacts of the inner heel and the first metatarsal head on both sides evenly. That doesn't mean we lose the outside foot and roll off of it. That just means that's where our focus is on both sides evenly, our bias is there. Now, Feeling on the wall, the most important contact of our low back is our PSIS. Those are those kind of bony spots at the backside of our pelvis. We'll put up an image to show you where that is. So Trevor's gonna be focusing on those foot contacts and on the wall, the PSIS evenly on both sides relative to what he's capable of doing. Now he's gonna place his hands on a chair, ideally something that he can kind of roll or push and he's just gonna reach it away from him, not letting his sternum depress. So he's gonna stay, again, nice and tall and stacked. So he's just gonna reach that slightly away. That's gonna give him some protraction of the shoulder. His shoulder blade is gonna move away from his spine, but he's gonna remain tall. Now all he's gonna do is breathe in through his nose, silently, out through his mouth, sighing the air out. For about five to eight seconds of an exhale. At the end of that exhale, he might feel a little side abs engaged. Not six pack abs, but side abs. He's going to maintain a slight contraction in those side abs as he silently, super slowly inhales through his nose. And that's going to give him some nice opening of the backside of his rib cage. And he should feel some expansion back there. All the while, remember, don't lose that PSIS on the wall on either side. Don't lose those foot contacts on either side. The biggest thing to watch out for here is people have the tendency to clench their lower glutes. We do not want that to happen. We are trying to stay as relaxed as possible. So please check in with yourself and ask, are my glutes relaxed? And if not, then what you can do is give that ball a little squeeze, maybe a three or four out of 10, not much more than that before you try to find your PSIS contact and those foot contacts. So squeeze, then go, and that should make it easier for you to keep your glutes relaxed. The biggest mistake we see here is when people inhale, because we're trying to get expansion in the back, people have a tendency to stand up as they inhale because their ribs tend to be so flared in this like static posture that they have. We need the ribs to stay down. So maintain that reach. If not, reach just a tiny bit more as you inhale, that'll give you nice expansion of your back. But conversely, don't overreach. So if you overreach, you're gonna depress your sternum and then you're gonna become really rounded and your head's gonna jet forward. Try not to do that. 
try to make sure that you maintain that position you got with the PSIS contact and the foot contacts. Really, all you need to do is just maintain a slight reach with some protraction throughout the entire set and you're gonna be doing things right. Now I'm giving you some exercises that should provide some immediate relief, but there are other influences that are beyond the scope of this video that can affect our center of mass. Now let's say for some reason, and that could be a variety of different reasons, you have a forward head posture because you have tightness of muscles on the front side of your neck and your chest. That is going to pull your head forward and further facilitate this forward center of mass. So until we learn to decompress tone on the front side of our neck and chest, we are not gonna be able to get our heads stacked over our ribs and our hips and we're constantly going to be pulled forward. So we need to address everything in the body as a cohesive unit. And the best way you can do that or start to do that would be with my beginner body restoration program. I will link that down below in the description. Now what we need to do, and this is especially true for people who have issues on one side of their body more than the other with this, is that we need to learn how to open up that space on the back side of our pelvis and hold on to it and be able to dynamically open and close the back side of our pelvis. We refer to this as the outlet of the pelvis, this section down here. Notice how when I stretch out the space between the piriformis and the femur right here, we have this part of the bone move away. That is internal rotation of the hip. When the space closes, that is going to cause the femur to slide forward within the hip socket. That is external rotation. So we need to teach our body how to open up that space and close it dynamically and do that while keeping our center of mass stacked in a proper way. Here is a great way that you can do this. Something I really like for this is get a ball or something you can put in between your thighs and that way your knees can stay in line with your toes and your hips. Now find something about waist height like a desk or a box and place your hands on it with your feet about six-ish inches away from that box or desk. Take a very slight step back with the side you wanna work. So I'm gonna work my left in this example. I'm gonna put my left toes in line with my right foot, midfoot, or arch. Keep your eyes up, slightly bend your knees on both sides, and then get heavy on your left inner heel. And on the right side, you wanna be heavy on the foot arch. That's gonna help push you over to that side on the left or whatever side you're gonna be working. So you want about two thirds of your weight on the stance leg left side and a third of the weight on the passive leg. And now you wanna make sure your pelvis is neutral. So if it was a bowl of water, it's not dumping out the front or the back. It's nice and neutral and relaxed. And all you're gonna do is staying heavy on that inside heel on the back side. You're just going to exhale squat down a little bit, maintaining your weight on that left foot. Stopping once you feel like you can't go any lower without overly rounding your back. So once you get to that point, hold that for a second as you inhale. Exhale, push through that inner heel and stand up to the relative extent that you can. But at the top, you're obviously gonna have a little bit of your knees bent still. So reps look like this. You're gonna feel a lot of inner thigh adductor muscle on the side you're working and some quad. You do not wanna feel much on the passive side. Also, when you get down into that bottom position, you're going to feel potentially a little bit of a stretch in the back of your hip right here. That's good. That's you moving into that internally rotated position. Now keep in mind that from the back view, you wanna make sure that your hip is going slightly off to the side on the way down, but your knee is staying in line with your toes, so to speak. Now you don't wanna to get too far over here, but to make it really simple, all you really have to do is kind of push your weight over to the left side or whatever side is back and find that inner heel after that and make sure that you're maintaining weight back there and you're gonna be moving into a good position if you do that. Another common mistake is making sure that this front knee doesn't drift behind that back knee there. So keep that together. That'll help you stay shifted into this hip. Now, I highly encourage you not to push this too far too soon. Don't get all the way down there and it'll look terrible. Just work within your range of motion. If it's just this, that's okay. Work through that. You can even just simply sit here and focus on those foot contacts and kind of just push the forward knee forward a little bit and the back knee in. You're gonna find that inner thigh adductor muscle. 
keep your glute relaxed, and you can just sit here and breathe. I'd recommend doing this for about five to eight reps of going down or up, or just eight breaths holding the top position. I would recommend doing these exercises twice a day for maximum results. Two sets of the exercises you've seen in order of about five to eight breath cycles, going nice and slow, paying attention to each of the cues, doing them properly. And if you do that, you should start to see some longer term success because you're giving your body the input it needs to be able to open up this space and hold on to it.